stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Job sees the point, and the storm in his soul is quieted. He still doesn't know, of course, why God has permitted him to be afflicted, but he does know that God, being God, must indeed have a good reason. The same goes for Christians in the puzzling passages we're thinking about. Only Christians know something that Job didn't. Christians know about the overwhelming divine love revealed in the saga of incarnation and atonement. The divine Son of God became human, suffered and died so that we human beings, we who had turned our backs upon God, could be restored to fellowship with him. God the Father, the first being of the universe, the creator of all else, loved the world so much that he was willing to allow his Son to go undergo suffering, humiliation, and death. As the Heidelberg Catechism puts it, the bitterly cruel and shameful death of the cross, so that human beings could be restored to fellowship with him. God the Son was willing to undergo the suffering and pain and humiliation heaped upon him in his death on the cross, so that sinners could be once more at one with God. This story of atonement is the greatest story ever told and indeed the greatest story that could be told. A story told, a story by virtue of which Alpha, the actual world, is among the best possible worlds. So we are perplexed about those Old Testament passages. Did God really command something like genocide? Or is he, or is what is teaching here something we can't figure out? But then we recall the love revealed in incarnation and atonement. And we see that whatever God did, he must indeed have had a good reason, even if we can't see what that reason is. This brings me to my second topic, atonement. Of course, there are various theories of atonement, the ransom theory, the satisfaction theory, the exemplar theory, and still others, with variations on each. I suppose, many, I suppose most Christians have accepted some version of a satisfaction theory and many have thought in terms of a substitutionary or vicarious atonement, often connected with punishment or penalty. Christ suffered the penalty due, human, due to sinful human beings. Thales raises familiar questions. How can one person be justly punished for the transgressions of another? And how can the death of Jesus Christ satisfy the debt incurred by human sin, says Thales, uh, quote, however poignant the sacrifice of another on our behalf, we should be mortified to accept that offer, unquote. Here, my moral intuitions differ substantially from his. Though I am or aim to be mortified by my sin, and am therefore mortified that my sin has occasioned Christ's sacrifice, I am or aim to be maximally delighted to accept that gracious offer, and maximally grateful for the reconciliation it provides. As for the objections, here there may be less than meets the eye. True, at a human level, perhaps the punishment due my sin can't ordinarily be rightly inflicted on someone else, even if that someone else voluntarily accepts it. But suppose I sin against someone A and someone else B offers to accept the penalty properly accruing to me. Suppose, furthermore, A agrees to this arrangement and considers that amends have properly been made. This would be somewhat weird and even perhaps morally questionable, but not obviously out of question, out of the question from a moral point of view. For, furthermore, the reasons it is questionable, the reason it is questionable is that it really isn't up to A whether or not I am guilty. His holding or failing to hold me guilty doesn't determine whether or not I am guilty. There is another party to the transaction, namely the moral law. But when we add that the injured person is God himself, things drastically change. Three minute warning. First, there is, excuse me? About three minutes. Three minutes? Yeah. Oh, that's plenty. <laughs> First, there is this difference in status between God and us. We are persons and God is a person. But the moral constraints on interactions between human persons don't all carry over to, the, to moral constraints on interactions between God and human persons. God is not just another exceptionally impressive human being. 
And second, as at least many Christians see things, God himself is the origin of moral constraints. It is his will, his commands, or his approval, that determines what is right and wrong, morally acceptable or morally objectionable. Moral obligation is established by his commands to his morally aware creatures. What about moral constraints on God himself? Presumably God does not issue commands to himself. Demand, divine command would be the source of moral constraints on his creatures, but not on God himself. This would be an important difference between God and his creatures. So what about constraints on, for example, the sort of divine human interaction we are considering? Here what counts is what God approves or disapproves. If God considers human beings guilty because of the sins they commit, then human beings are indeed guilty. If God approves, as no doubt he does, of his accepting the sacrifice of his son, son on the cross as a propitiation for human sin, then that arrangement is morally impeccable. If God is willing to accept the death of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, as restoring the moral balance, then indeed the death of the second person of the Trinity restores the moral balance. What about intuitions to the contrary? Our intuitions to the contrary. I suggest first that these arise from considering God as just one more specially talented human being, a sort of ubermensch. Second, there's no guarantee that our moral intuitions are entirely accurate. Earlier generations found sexual sin much more appalling than we do. We find intolerance, racial or otherwise, more appalling than they did. Human moral intuitions differ, conflict, change, and we can't be all right. This doesn't mean that we can't trust our intuitions or that we have any moral alternative to acting in accord with them, but it does mean that we have to be open to the possibility that some of them aren't entirely accurate. And the same goes for our intuitions, if we have them, in this case, about what God would and wouldn't do. Now we'll have a five-minute reply from Professor Fales. I want to thank Alvin Planninger for his thoughtful and characteristically forthright response. <clears throat> About those hairs I started, I did also have it in mind to bag them and boil them. I'll respond to uh, Plantinga by giving further brief chase to three of them. <clears throat> First, um, Plantinga accuses me of creative hermeneutics, a charge that carries a certain sting. Have I strayed outside the word? Far be it from me. Obeying the Lord, Israel slew every male Midianite, Numbers 31, 7, and then apportioned the war's booty of 32,000 Midianite virgins, 31, 25 to 47. <clears throat> and recall Deuteronomy 21, 10, which uh, I believe Ed Curley had up, up here and discussed. Attractive women captured in war may be taken to wife after a month's respite to mourn loss of family. Indeed, it was Mike Bergman who presciently urged me to take explicit account of this law in footnote 19 of my paper. Well, suppose improbably that every Israelite soldier carried in his heart that commandment's imperative for a 30-day delay. How is that not licensed to rape? Counterfactuals with impossible antecedents are bad customers. But everything I know about Al makes me morally certain of this one. Were he God, he would never have dreamed of commanding Israel soldiers as Yahweh commanded them. Planning his own creativity is at least a match for mine. He flirts with Craig's justification for the slaughter of Canaanite children, but ignores my responses to Craig, and also the fact that an afterlife is alien to the world of the Pentateuch, and hence to Israel's understanding of the moral implications of harem. Concerning Job, 
he elides the fact that though Job is left in the dark, the text actually tells us what God's motive was. Because I said I would reject Old Testament morality and the Christian plan of salvation, Plantinga describes me as condemning the moral judgment of Christians. But that's not what I meant to do. Regarding the offer of salvation by the cross, I took care to assert only that I would find it morally indefensible for me to accept it. I do not pronounce this judgment on Christians, for I'm really unsure how they see the matter. 